Steve Wallow right over here and it's uh, Orchestra Hall after hours and a rather magnificent tour rich with contemporary musicians. Steve, uh, our memories and conversation here go back uh, to those early 50s in New York when you were just growing up as a citizen in New Jersey and we were just recalling some rather rich days and the jazz spirit in New York in the 1950s. If I mention the club Bohemia, what do you say? Oh, that means a great deal to me. Well, we were talking about Oscar P Pettiford, who, who comes from this area and, uh, before, and uh, he was only one of the magnificent bass players I heard there at that time. Percy Heath was playing there a lot. I remember one night hearing a Miles Davis band that was comprised of uh, Sonny Rollins, Tommy Flanagan, Paul Chambers, and Art Taylor. I'll never forget that one. That was a it was a beauty and that within that that area of new york city there were three or four other places that were readily accessible i was in my teens at this time with phony ids and and all and it was, it was very exciting and formative period for me yeah. well the uh, exposure to those musicians certainly must have impressed certain flashes and memories and uh, you mentioned something about a ten-piece group with oscar pettiford at birdland who was a part of that and what kind of music were they playing Oh boy, that, that was a wonderful band. I, I got to hear that band for my 14th birthday. My parents hired somebody to take me to Birdland to hear this band because I'd been, been bugging them to see it. And it was Oscar and I believe a second bass player too, but I'm not sure who it was. Uh, Wendell Marshall, I think, as a matter of fact. O.C. Johnson was playing drums. Uh, Joe Wilder and Art Farmer. Jimmy Cleveland, Gigi Grice. And uh, I'm stumped on the rest, but th that was some really exciting music. And there was also a re rehearsal studio in New York at that time. Uh, maybe you remember the name. Of Nola, Nola Studio. Nola, was it? Right. And, uh, and I was taken up there as a part of my jazz tour of New York, and, and I was just stunned at the, uh, at the music that was going on and, and also the life that was swirling about in there. The Baroness was there that day, and it was, a, it was an exotic afternoon for a... Uh, 14-year-old from New Jersey, I think. Certainly formed a, a, a basis for your experiences in jazz. How would you contrast the 70s, 1976, against the 50s, the eclecticism of today and the, um, uh, the drawing from so many different uh, streams of music compared to, say, the 50s, which was fairly rigid, I think. Yeah, I think there, there was a, a strong orthodoxy in the in the 50s, although I'm not sure that it was a, a bad thing at that time that that, that was the case. And uh, uh, by contrast, I'm not sure that it's a good thing that the six, that the, the music of the 60s is as diffuse as it is. Probably, it's a, I, rather than make a judgment on it, though, I'd, I would just concur that that uh, there are as many styles as there are players. It would appear these days. And uh, it's. N is there any special direction that you sense or feel? Uh, on, only my own, only in reference to my own music and the, and the, the few people with whom I, I seem to share that. Uh, I have no broad sense of what the, what the music is doing whatsoever. I have difficulty keeping up with all the, the, uh, the records that are coming out these days, in, in fact. Uh, my own music I'm pretty sure of, but I ought to be at this time. I'm 36. Your, uh, your instrument and your influences, how do they tie together? For example, your exposure to certain musicians um, opened the door for you. Who were some of those musicians that uh, just opened that door? Well, it, we were talking about bass players of Oscar Pettiford's generation, and that's, that's, that's really what I came up in. I, I was... Uh, Primarily influenced by Percy Heath, I think, but also by Oscar Pettiford and Mingus and Paul Chambers and subsequently. But those were really the, the ones who made a strong impression on me. And that, that's a funny thing because I no longer play the acoustic bass at all. I play only the electric bass. But the electric bass has a, a pretty limited tradition it's, itself. It's a relatively new instrument and it, and it hasn't been applied to too often in the area in which I'm, I'm playing it. So I, I think my influences have remained constant, even though obviously the vocabulary and style of playing on the electric bass has to change. Well, looking at each of these bassists whom you named, uh, starting with Percy Heath, uh, what, um, what impressed you about his uh, technique and style? 
Oh, well, Percy's left hand is, is really a, a beautiful thing. He, uh, I was impressed by his tone and by, by where he put it, just where he put the, the, the ictus of the, of the thing. You know, he and Kenny Clark, I used to hear play together at, at some length, and I, I thought that was perfect, you know, just perfect. Uh, Chambers. Paul, I, well, it's, it comes out too neat, but Paul, I particularly liked Paul's right hand, as a matter of fact. It was a beautiful kind of waterfall motion that he made when he, when he played quarter notes that, that was a phenomenal thing to see. And he also had a, had a remarkable sound, and a full resonance in the bass register and a lot of sustain and the ability to, to affect the envelope of his note in such a way as to, to keep the buoyancy in the music. And Oscar Pettiford. Oh, well, he, he, he and he and uh, he and Mingus too. As far as that that goes, I see as uh, as extremely assertive and aggressive people who really uh, thrust the bass forward in terms of its role in the community. You know, I mean, b both of those guys really took after the front line. If if they felt they had to, you know, and 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 carved out some territory for the bass that it hadn't had before, and made a lot of technical advances along the way too, as far as that goes. I never had heard that expression, but I always sensed that Mingus and, and Pettiford were always front line. That they could, you know, they were right in the reed section and right out front, and they were with the trumpets uh, blowing. Yeah, and they took no nonsense either whatsoever. You know, they really insisted on that role, and that's what had to happen for the for for these other players to come through. I think after them. Steve Swallow, thanks very much for your views of of jazz and the way you feel it and sense it. And a pleasure to talk to you at Orchestra Hall in Minneapolis, after I don't know about 20 years between here and Club Bohemia. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed it myself. <laughs>